Hey, everybody, you're listening to A New Beginning, which is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners. If this program has impacted you, I'd love to hear from you. So just send an email to me at greg at harvest.org. Again, it's greg at harvest.org. You can learn more about becoming a Harvest Partner by going to harvest.org. When Jesus rose from the dead on that first Easter, Pastor Greg Laurie says everything changed. In a very real sense, death itself died. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And when Jesus died and rose again, he rendered death powerless. That's the power of what happened when Christ rose. This is the day. the most important holidays on the calendar are Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Without the Lord's death, commemorated on Good Friday, there's no forgiveness of sin. And regarding the resurrection, Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. As we prepare for Good Friday and Easter, Pastor Greg Laurie brings a special message today on the new beginning. Insight to help us gain a fuller appreciation for the Lord's sacrifice. So I heard about a man who went with his family on vacation to Israel, including his ever nagging mother-in-law. Now there's a lot of great mothers-in-law, okay, just, but this mother-in-law nagged a lot. And sadly, while they were in the Holy Land, she died. And so he went to a local undertaker and he said, I need to uh, deal with this uh, how can you help me ship the body back to the United States? The man said, yes, it'll cost you around $5,000 to ship her body. But then the undertaker said, but you know what? You can bury her here in the Holy Land for $250. What a great deal. And the guy says, oh, that's okay. I'll ship her back to America. The undertaker said, sir, I don't understand. She would be here in the Holy Land the land of the apostles, the land of the prophets. You could bury her here for $250. And the man said, sir, 2,000 years ago, a man was buried here and rose again from the dead. I can't take that chance. (laughs) Well, I have an announcement to make. Death died when Christ rose. In fact, Easter, yes, it's true. Easter is a day that death effectively died. And because Jesus died, I as a Christian will never die. You say, Greg, you're in denial. You're gonna die. Oh, I understand that one day my body may go into the ground unless the rapture comes first and the Lord calls me to heaven along with all you guys. But if that doesn't happen, yes, my body will go on the ground, but I'll never die because my soul will live on and one day there'll be a bodily resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And when Jesus died and rose again, he rendered death powerless. The only way we're coming out of the grave is because Jesus was willing to go into it. Easter was the death of death. One person put it this way, quote, death used to be an executioner. The resurrection makes him just a gardener. That's the power of what happened when Jesus rose. And this was all God's plan. This came as a revelation to the disciples. They thought Jesus had come as a militant Messiah who would drive out the tyrannical Romans and establish the kingdom of Israel once again. But what they failed to see was He was gonna be the suffering savior in fulfillment of Bible prophecies like Isaiah 53 that describes his death and Psalm 22 that opens with the words, they pierced my hands and my feet. They missed all of that. And so when Jesus was crucified, it seemed as though everything 
was falling apart. It seemed as if the dream was turning into a nightmare. But in reality, everything was going according to plan. That is God's plan. Because Peter on the day of Pentecost said in Acts 2, this Jesus following the deliberate and well thought out plan of God. This was a deliberate, well thought out plan of God. Yes, for him to die, but also for him to rise. And Jesus spoke of this frequently. He brought it up, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna rise again from the dead three days later. They kept missing this memo. And now we're gonna see how shocked they were, how surprised they were, how unexpected this event was as we come to Matthew 28, starting in verse one. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke with the women, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And you will see him there. Remember what I've told you. The women ran very quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened and they were also filled with great joy and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message as they went. And I love this. Jesus met them and greeted them there. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Wow. See, here was the problem. The authors of the Gospels had never read the Gospels. <laughs> they didn't know how the story ended. This was actually unfolding for them in real time. And I love this verse, verse eight. They were very frightened and filled with great joy. Have you ever felt that way? Frightened and joyful at the same time? Sort of like riding on a roller coaster. You know, it's kind of exciting and also kind of terrifying. I decided a long time ago, I hate all roller coasters. I don't even know if I liked them when I was a kid. But I, I got on them because, you know, my friends got on them. But I always remember, you know, going up to the big drop and, and I would look down and see people on the ground and I would think I would give anything to be with them right now instead of up here. <laughs> so it's kind of a combination of, of fear and great joy. There are things in life that are that way as well. Uh, for instance, the first time you buy a house or when you get married or when you have your first child. It's a combination of fear and great joy. For me now, the biggest risk I'm gonna take is, hey, I'll go ahead and try that chef special. That's the risk I'm willing to take. But uh, we've all experienced fear and great joy. And as they're walking along, verse nine, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. This is interesting because this phrase, met them, is a word that speaks of a common greeting, like hi or good morning. In other words, it was a common greeting of the day. If I were Jesus and I'd risen, my first words would have been, ta-da. <laughs> but that's not what he said. It was, it was almost as though Jesus said, hey, like if you're walking down the street and someone's walking your direction, you say, hello, hi. You know? Or if you're in Hawaii, you say, How's it? Or how's it, bra? Or aloha. And if you're in Australia, you'll say, good day. And if you're in the South, you'll say, hey. And if you're in New York, you don't say anything because you're rude, right? <laughs> it's just the way it is. But it was a very kind of low-key greeting. Almost as if Jesus just said, hey, what, Jesus? You're alive. It reminds me of a dream I've had more than once about my oldest son, Christopher, who's been in heaven for 14 years. And in my dream, I'm doing something with my family and suddenly I turn and he's there. I'm so excited. I'm so overwhelmed with joy to see him and I talk to him, but in my dream, he always is leaving, right? And so I wake up and I'm kind of excited and sad simultaneously, but Jesus was here. He wasn't leaving. He had come back 
from the dead again and he was effectively picking up where he last left off. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. We hear from so many people who find Christ through the Harvest Crusades, like this woman. Pastor Greg, I grew up going to church as a child with my family on a military post. As an adult, I married into a military family, and my husband and I were stationed in California. One day, some of the other military wives invited me to one of your Harvest Crusades. It was there that I heard for the first time what a true relationship with Jesus Christ was. I can't thank you enough. You have touched so many lives, including mine, and you're a blessing to so many. Thanks, Pastor Greg. Do you have a story to share with Pastor Greg? If so, email him and tell him about it. Send it to greg at harvest.org. Again, that's greg at harvest.org. Well, glad you're along today for Pastor Greg's message called A New Day Dawning. Here's Pastor Greg once again. Turn over to Luke chapter 14. This is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. Jesus joining the two discouraged disciples on the Emmaus road. We read in verse 13. The same day two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them named Cleopas replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. And Jesus asked, what things? I love that, what things? Uh, hello? But he, he's sort of acting as though he, he doesn't know what they're even talking about. Have you ever taken a walk to clear your mind a little bit? I find that's a good thing to do. You know, you just want to think about something and maybe you take a walk with someone and you're discussing something intently as you're seeking to sort of resolve it or sort it out. You know, sometimes my wife will say, I'm going to go on a walk with some of my girlfriends and I'll say, great, see you in three hours. She'll say, why do you say that? I say, because you don't go on a walk you go on a talk, okay? It's nonstop talking, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And so that's exactly what's happening here. These two disciples are walking, but they're talking. They're, they're trying to understand what has happened to them and who joins them. Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. Did you know Jesus is walking with you too? Whatever you're going through, he's walking with you through it. He's interested in what you're facing. Of course, he knows all about it. If it troubles you, it concerns him. And Jesus asked him this question, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? So now they find themselves in the unique position of telling Jesus about Jesus. And then they make this tone deaf statement of verse 22. And it's been three days since this happened. And some women said, Jesus is alive. It doesn't say this in the verse, but I wonder if Jesus rolled his eyes. Like, seriously? How many times did I tell you this, you guys? How many times did I tell you I would be betrayed, I'd be crucified, I'd rise again from the dead three days later, and you're literally saying, it's been three days since this happened, and women said that I was alive and you don't even understand what's taking place. And then he calls them fools. He says, oh, you fools, slow to understand. And he takes them on a guided tour of all of those Old Testament passages that pointed to Messiah. See, Jesus is in all of the Bible. He's in the Old Testament concealed. He's in the New Testament revealed. So he's saying, he Here's all those times when I made appearances in the Old Testament. All those times when the story was pointing to me like when Abraham was willing to offer his son Isaac. And there was a last minute reprieve from heaven. But remember what God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love and offer him 
to me and all those verses. And as he's telling them these things, they're thinking, man, this guy really knows the Bible. I mean, you'd think he was there when it happened. Yeah, getting closer, getting closer. They're beginning to stir. And then they come to the end of their journey and they said, would you stay with us? And he sat down at a table. They took out a small loaf of bread and they prayed and suddenly they realized who he was and he disappeared. And then they said in verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And with reignited hearts, burning with hope, they went back to be with the Christians in Jerusalem. Luke 24, 33, within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem where the 11 disciples and the other followers of Jesus were gathered. You know, sometimes we wonder why our hearts grow cold as Christians. We wonder why we don't have the same passion that we had when we first became followers of Jesus Christ. Here's the answer. It's because we distance ourselves from God by distancing ourselves from other believers. See, these two believers had separated themselves from the other Christians in Jerusalem. They wanted to put as much distance between them and that bloody cross as possible. They wanted to erase it from their memories. But any step away from the cross is always a step in the wrong direction. You want to run to the cross, not away from it. But they didn't understand it. And now Jesus himself is helping them to understand. You know with this uh, Jesus Revolution film, I've done a lot of interviews uh, for it. And so many people have told me that they were so moved watching it. And so many people have told me they cried through the whole movie. And I asked them, why did you cry watching this movie? And the answer is, something moves them. And I think maybe it's a little bit of a flashback to use a 60s phrase to their earlier life as a follower of Jesus Christ. I think especially the baptism scenes seem to really move people because it takes us back to where we were before. And one question I've been asked more than once is, how can we keep the revival fire burning in our hearts and my answer is simply this. If you want to see revival, do revival-like things. It's a little bit like marriage. If you've lost the romance in your marriage, go back and do romantic things. But instead we say, well, we've lost the romance. Time to trade him in on the newest model. Time to abandon the marriage. It's just not working. No, you can get your marriage strong and vibrant again. Don't wait for the emotion, just do the right things again. I mean, think about this. <laughs> Guys, when you first took your wife to be out on a date, what did you do? Well, probably you actually wore clean clothes. <laughs> you actually had a thought about your appearance. And then you went to the car and you opened her door for her to let her in the car. And then you went to a restaurant and you pulled the chair out for her to be seated and then you even brought her a little gift. Remember that? Now when you go out, you uh, close the door on her when she's not all the way in the car. <laughs> you pull the chair out in the restaurant, you just don't put it back in, and when she falls, you laugh and point at her. And the last gift you brought her was a lot of dirty laundry, okay? So you need to get back and do what you were doing before. So take it over to the spiritual realm. If you wanna see romance in your marriage, do romantic things. If you want to see revival in your life, do revival like things. Now we've all heard about this outpouring of the Spirit that happened in Asbury College, right? People were literally coming from around the world to see the revival. Listen, we don't need to go around the world chasing revivals like storm chasers. Oh, it's over here. Let's go over there. Revival can happen with you right here, right now, personally. So get back and do the things that you used to do. Pastor Greg Laurie 
with practical counsel for reigniting our faith. And there's more to come as this study continues here on A New Beginning. But it may be that your faith doesn't so much need reigniting as it needs to be kindled and set ablaze from the very beginning. Maybe you realize there's some distance between you and the Lord, and you'd like to close that distance right now. Pastor Greg, someone can come to God and begin a relationship with Him today, can't they? They can, and it's so simple. And I think because it's so simple, people think, oh, it can't be that easy. Well, look, Jesus did all the heavy lifting. He carried the cross for you. He died on that cross that he carried. This isn't about what you do. It's about what he's done. But here's what the Bible says. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You say, well, okay, how do I do that? You do it through prayer. And if you pray this prayer after me, I believe God will hear it and answer it, and Christ will come to live inside of you. So if you want Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that you'll go to heaven when you die— If you want to fill that big hole in your heart, pray these words if you would. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. I am sorry for my sin, and I turn from it now. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Be my Savior and my Lord. Be my God and my friend. Thanks for hearing this prayer. In answering this prayer, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to know that God has heard you and has answered it. The Bible says, these things we write to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may know it's yours now. God has given it to you because it's the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Congratulations. And welcome to the family of God. Amen. And listen, we want to help you get started in this new relationship with the Lord. Would you let us send you something? It's free of charge. It's Pastor Greg's New Believer's Bible. Scores of people have read this edition of God's Word. New believers love the study helps written just for them. And they appreciate that it's in an easy-to-understand translation. We'll send it to you today. Just ask for the New Believer's Bible when you call 1-800-821-3300. You can call any time, 1-800-821-3300, or go online to harvest.org. Well, it's a real joy to have New York Times bestselling author Lee Strobel with us today. You probably know him best because of his first book, The Case for Christ. But Lee, you've got a brand new book called Is God Real? Now, years ago, you were an atheist. Yeah. You didn't believe God existed. What's the strongest evidence Mm -hmm. in your new book? The evidence that maybe on its own might have convinced you of the existence of God? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You know, um, looking back, I would have been convinced as an atheist that God exists based on discoveries of modern science. You know, scientists for centuries believed that the universe was eternal. It never began to exist. It always existed. It was static. And yet, thanks to a series of scientific discoveries over the last 50 years, every scientist now believes virtually that that the universe had a beginning at some point in the past. And Mm -hmm. that has led to a very powerful argument for the existence of God. Uh, It says, whatever begins to exist has a cause. We now know that the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause behind it. And then you ask, well, what kind of a cause can bring a universe into existence? (laughs) Well, it must be transcendent because it's separate from creation. Mm -hmm. Must be spirit because it existed before the physical world existed. Must be eternal because he existed before physical time was brought into being. Must be powerful given the immensity of the creation event. Must be smart given the precision of the creation event. Must be personal because he had to make the decision to create. Must be creative because, my goodness, just look at this universe and how creative mm-hmm. it is. He must be loving because he so carefully crafted a habitat where we could flourish in. And then the scientific principle of Occam's razor tells us there would be just one creator. So what have we got? Transcendent, spirit, eternal, powerful, smart, personal, creative, loving, unique. That is a description of the God of the Bible. Hmm. And, and so if, if I just had that... 
And if I just had the other area of discoveries in recent decades in physics for the fine-tuning of the universe, Mm -hmm. where scientists now believe that our universe is finely tuned on a razor's edge so that life can exist in a way that defies the explanation that it could have been just by mere chance. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. Um, There's about 50 to 100 parameters of the universe that have to be exactly precisely calibrated so that life can exist. One of them is the force of gravity. So we all know what gravity is. Well, if you imagine a ruler that goes across the entire known universe, 15 billion light year width of the universe, broken down in one inch increments, that represents the plausible range along which the force of gravity could have been set anywhere along that ruler. And yet it's set at the exact right place so that life can exist. Well, what if we were to change it? What if we were to change it one inch compared to the 15 billion light year width of the universe? Intelligent life would be impossible anywhere in the universe. Hmm. So we have 50 to 100 of these parameters. And I asked one physicist, I said, well, what are the odds this could have happened by chance? And he looked at me and he said, you know, we physicists have a term for that. I said, what? He said, ain't going to (laughs) happen. So, And so, you know, if you just gave me as an atheist these two areas of science, cosmology and physics, personally, that would be enough to convince me that there is a God, a creator. So you're listening to Lee Strobel, and I bet that someone out there listening right now knows someone who at least claims to be an atheist. What a great tool to have in your hands and say, read this book called Is God Real? And let's talk about it later. We would like to send it to you this month for your gift of any size. And we encourage you to be generous because whatever you send, we'll use that to continue to bring this radio broadcast to people that need to hear the Word of God. So get your copy right now of Is God Real? by Lee Strobel. Yeah, that's right. And we'll be glad to send it your way to say thank you for your donation right now. Again, it's called Is God Real? And time is running out for us to mention this resource, so get in touch with us right away. Just go to harvest.org and look for that title. Or just give us a phone call at 1-800-821-3300. Call any time, day or night, 1-800-821-3300. Hey, everybody, I want to encourage you to check out the new Harvest Plus app. It's on Roku, Apple TV, and Google Play, among others. And you can stream incredible content on all major platforms for free. You're going to find live events, our evangelistic films like A Rush of Hope, Johnny Cash, The Redemption of an American Icon, Steve McQueen, The Salvation of an American Icon, and our newest film, Fame. Plus, our TV programs, our podcast, Harvest at Home, and a lot more. Stream it all on any device for free using the new Harvest Plus app. Well, next time, we'll focus on Jesus' message to the two downhearted disciples and his message to those of us facing discouragement in the 21st century. Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher, Greg Laurie. A New Beginning is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. If this show has impacted your life, share your story, leave a review on your favorite podcast app, and help others find hope.